Hi everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology. Uh, the purpose of this video is to go through the multiple choice section of the 2019 National 5 Biology exam. The idea of this is to go through the questions, I'll explain what they are, I will give the answers and I'll give an explanation. The easiest thing for you might be that when you come to a question, you can pause it, attempt it yourself, then I'll give you the answer and then I'll give you the explanation why. If you get the answer right, then fantastic. Uh, but if you've got the answer wrong, it's important for you to have a look at why you got it wrong. You may just have made a mistake, you may have misread the question, or you might not be entirely sure of a concept. So that's what's most important about this one here. So the 2019 paper can be found on the SQA website. Uh, I'll try and attach a link to it here for you as well. Or you can just do this on the screen, like I said, pausing each time. So let's get started. So for question one, it's asking about animal cells in a solution. So it says animal cells left in a solution with a lower water concentration than their contents. What happens to them? Do they shrink? Do they burst? Do they become turgid? Or do they become plasmalized? Now again, just because it's the first question, I'll just remind you, if you want to hit pause, give this a go, A, B, C, or D. I'll give the answer. Now I'll walk through this. So for question one, the answer is A, it would shrink. So there's two things here. First of all, in terms of a osmosis question, it's an animal cell. So animal cells will either shrink or they will burst. If you remember, turgid and plasmalized is only what happens to plant cells. Second of all, it's saying that these animal cells are left in a solution with a lower water concentration than the cell's contents. So if you remember, in osmosis, it's the movement of water from a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration. So in this case, the water would move from the higher concentration inside the cell until it will move to the solution. So that means that water will leave the cell and that animal cell is going to shrink. So again, A. Uh, for question two, we have a typical plant cell and we have three parts labelled, K, L and M. Now it asks which of the labelled parts could also be found in a typical fungal cell. So the answer for number two is D. You would find K, L and M. You'd find all three of those in a uh, fungal cell. So K is the cytoplasm, L is the cell wall and M is the nucleus. Uh, the only thing here that would not be found in a fungal cell is that vacuole in the middle, but the vacuole has not been labelled. So it's a bit of a trick question. All three of those can be found. For question three, we have a question about protein synthesis. It says the diagram shows stages in the production of a protein in a cell. So we have DNA, and then stage one to mRNA, then stage two to a protein. Which row in the table identifies the exact location of each stage? So for question three, the correct answer would be B. So if you remember stage one, a copy of mRNA is made in the nucleus. And then for this stage two, the mRNA travels to the ribosome where amino acids are brought across to synthesize proteins. So again, that'd be B, stage one in the nucleus and stage two in the ribosome. Question four is a DNA question. And it asks you, a single strand of DNA contains 830 adenine, 929 cytosine, 774 guanine and 615 thymine bases. So how many guanine bases would be in the complementary strand? So for this one here, uh, the correct answer is D. Now, it's D because you don't need to go into any sort of complicated counting up or anything here. It's telling you that in one strand of DNA, there is 929 cytosine. However, you should remember that cytosine is complementary to guanine. So that complementary strand is going to have the same number of guanine bases as the number of cytosine bases on the single strand. So it's asking you how many guanine bases would be in the complementary strand. It's going to match with cytosine, of which there's 929. So there's going to be 929 guanine as well. For question five, you might need to take a little bit longer to look at as you're taking information from a graph that says that proteins are broken down in the stomach into polypeptides. The graph shows the concentration of proteins and polypeptides in the stomach over 90 minutes. 
So first thing to look at here is we've got the time going along the bottom, we have the concentration going up the side, and if we use our key, the black line is the protein concentration and the dashed line is the polypeptide. Um, it's asking the ratio of protein concentration to polypeptide concentration in the stomach after 30 minutes. So the correct answer for five is B. It should be a concentration of five protein to three polypeptide. Now, the way we look at this is at 30 minutes, if you go up the line here and we look first of all at protein, you'll find that protein, the black line, is at 60, and the dashed line, the polypeptide, is at 36, if we have a look at what the scale is. So we start it off by, we have 60 to 36 as a ratio. If we break that down, again, finding a number that goes into both of them, we can simplify that to 10 to 6, but we can simplify that further by dividing by 2, of which we'll have 5 to 3. Um, so again, two skills here. You're reading information from a graph, but then you're also simplifying that ratio. Okay, so if you're not too sure about this one, that's a good part to be looking over for your scientific skills. For question six, we have a bit of a experimental design and respiration question here. It says four flasks, J, K, L and M, were set up to investigate the production of carbon dioxide during respiration. Uh, so hopefully you remember that lime water turns cloudy as uh, carbon dioxide is passed through it. And we can see in this diagram here, the air comes in from the left. Uh, sodium hydroxide is there to absorb any additional or excess carbon dioxide. We then have these worms in flask L and in flask M we have some lime water. And again, direction of air is going from left to right. You can see in flask L, there is five worms. The question is asking you to predict what would happen if only one worm was used in flask L. So the correct answer for six is C, The M would turn cloudy more slowly. So as I said, lime water turns cloudy in the presence of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide produced by the worms in flask L here is going to turn this lime water in flask M cloudy. And quite simply, there are five worms just now but it says what would happen or predict what would happen if only one worm was used in flask L. So that one worm is going to produce less carbon dioxide than the original five. So flask M, the lime water is still going to turn cloudy, but it's going to turn cloudy more quickly. It's not going to affect K because the flow of air is from left to right. So for six, the answer is C. For question seven, a fermentation question. So it asks, which of the following reactions takes place during fermentation in plant cells? So for question seven, the correct answer is A. In plant cells during fermentation, pyruvate is broken down into carbon dioxide and ethanol. If you got D as an answer, you're correct in thinking about fermentation, but you're thinking about it in animal cells. And the question is asking about plant cells. So seven is A. For question eight, we have a mitosis question. So the cell with 10 chromosome is divided by mitosis, and which row in the table identifies the number of daughter cells produced and the number of chromosomes in each daughter cell? So the correct answer for eight is C. There would be two daughter cells produced because through mitosis, one cell will divide into two daughter cells. And in terms of the number of chromosomes, it's told you at the top of the question that the cell originally had 10 chromosomes. These daughter cells are going to be genetically identical, so they will still have 10 chromosomes each. So be careful of that one. Don't think that it splits the number of chromosomes. They're producing two genetically identical daughter cells. Question nine is on to control and communication. It says, which row in the table shows the type of message that is transferred through various structures in a reflex arc. So you have a sensor neuron, a synapse, and a motor neuron. For question nine, the correct answer is B. So the sensor neuron would be electrical, the synapse would be chemical, and the motor neuron would be electrical. So remember, any message that passes along a neuron is going to be an electrical impulse, uh, but messages that travel across the gap between neurons are the synapse, 
they're going to be carried through chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. So make sure you get the order of those as well. Uh, question 10, another control and communication, <laughs> control and communication question is uh, hormones. So hormones are released by endocrine glands, blood cells, receptor cells, or target tissues. For question 10, quite simply, the correct answer is A. Hormones are produced by endocrine glands, which are throughout the endocrine system. Right, question 11 is another graph question here. So again, you might need to take a bit more time to have a look at these. It says the volume of one bird's testes was measured on the last day of each month for a year, and the graph shows the results. So if we just scroll down here, you can see the volume of testes on the left-hand side and the months along the bottom. And say so which of the following statements is true? So you need to take a bit of time going through each statement, A, B, C, and D, and see which one is true, and the rest of them should be false. So for question 11, the correct answer is D. It decreases for only four months of the year. Uh, just to run through these to uh, check answers for you, you can see for A, uh, the volume of testes is constant from the end of November to the end of February. That's not true because you can see there is a decrease in December, so that's false. For B, it says that the volume of testes increases more between the end of March and the end of April than any other month. Uh, you can see there is quite a sizable increase in that time. However, if you also look between June to the end of July, uh, you can see they have both increased by 200. So it's not more than any other month. There is another month that matches that increase. Uh, C increases for only five months of the year. If you take a look at the, the months, it increases for six months of the year, March, April, May, June, July, and also August. And then finally with D, which you're hoping is going to be true, it decreases for only four months of the year. It's September, October, November, and December is when the decrease is there. So D is correct. For these ones, always make sure you go through each one. Even if you think A is right, just double check that the rest of them are also wrong. So correct answer is D. For 12, a bit of genetics says which term describes the type of variation in which a characteristic is controlled by more than one gene. So for question 12, the correct answer is A, continuous. Now, if you remember, having more than one gene or being controlled by more than one gene is polygenic. So if you went for C, I can understand where you're coming from. However, the question is asking you which type of variation is controlled by it, which is continuous. So continuous variation is controlled by many genes, which is polygenic. Discrete variation, if you remember, is controlled by one gene or single gene inheritance. So 12 is A. For 13, we have a genetics question also. You would probably find this handy if you try and draw a Punnett square in this one to try and work out the answer. So it says albinism is a condition in which the production of a pigment that colors the skin is limited. It's controlled by a recessive allele. The diagram shows how a family was affected by the condition. So we have a father and a mother who are both unaffected and they have two children, one of which is affected and the other one is unaffected. And it's ask you the chance of this couple's third child being affected by a condition and you have to try and work out the chances out of four. So the correct answer of 13 is D, one in four chance. Now, it's hard to do this just on the screen here, but first of all, if you think of this albinism, uh, let's give it a A for its allele. So I think capital A dominant allele is going to be unaffected. It's told you that the recessive allele is what gives the condition. So a recessive lower letter A would be affected. So first of all, uh, it's told you here that both parents are unaffected. So they are either going to be homozygous dominant, big A, big A, or they could also be uh, heterozygous, so they could have one of each, they could have the dominant allele and they could have the recessive allele. Either way, they're both going to be unaffected. However, we see they do have one child that is affected, so that means they would have to both be heterozygous because they are both passing on a recessive allele, which has ended up with one of their children being affected by the recessive trait. If they were both homozygous dominant, uh, or if only one of them was heterozygous, 
that recessive allele would not show through in the phenotype. So therefore, they must both be heterozygous. And if you go and work out a Punnett square of this, of two big A little a's, then you'll find the chances of one of their offspring being affected is 25% or 1 in 4, which gives you D. For question 14, we're on to transport plants. It asks, which row in the table describes features of phloem? So the correct answer for 14 is A. Hopefully remember that the substance transported by phloem is sugar, xylem transports water, and they also have sieve plates within the phloem themselves. So sieve plates are present in phloem, they are not present in xylem. So 14 is A. On to transporting animals now, we have a diagram of the heart, and there is a blood vessel X and chamber Y being labelled here. It says which row in the table identifies X and Y. So the correct answer for 15 is C. Blood vessel X is the pulmonary artery and chamber Y is the right atrium. So first of all with X you can see this is the vessel that carries blood away from the heart. So if it's away it's going to be an artery and it's going towards the lungs so it's part of the pulmonary system. So it's the pulmonary artery that is taking blood to the lungs away from the heart. The pulmonary vein is what brings it back into this chamber here from the lungs. The last part here, here's your chambers. So hopefully remember your atrium is what's on top and below that you have your ventricles. So we know it's an atrium, but you should also remember that in the heart, your lefts and rights are flipped when we look at a diagram. So Y here would be the right atrium. So 15 is C. For 16, we have a table showing the composition of some of the gases in inhaled and exhaled air. Um, the question asks you how many times greater is the carbon dioxide concentration in exhaled air than in inhaled air. So for this question here, uh, the correct answer if you're wanting it is C, 100 times. Um, so first of all, the, again reading the question, it says how many times greater is the carbon dioxide concentration uh, so we're not looking at oxygen at all, we're only looking at the carbon dioxide at the bottom. And quite simply, if we look at the exhaled air, that is 4% carbon dioxide, uh, and the inhaled is 0.04% carbon dioxide. So if we divide 4 by the 0 0.04, we get an answer of 100, as it was 100 times greater than the 0 0.04 in the inhaled air. So 16 is C. For 17, we have another graph question, and it's showing you the results of an estimated grey seal pup population every two years from 2010 to 2016. It says, if the grey seal pup population continues to increase by the same number at each survey, what will be the estimated population in 2020? As you can see here, it's ending at 2016. The correct answer for 17 is B, 53,200. Now, this is a trickier one. Uh, for a prediction question, you need to first of all look at the pattern that's forming between each data set. So if you read the graph, you can see that every two years, there is an increase of uh, 1.8 thousand of the estimated population. So every two years, we're going up 1.8. So if you get to 2016 and you have a look at the um, if you have a look at the 2016 estimate, you add 1.8 to it, you should end up with 51,400. However, this will go up two years to 2018, and the question has asked you for the 2020 estimate. So if we add another 1.8 to your 51,400, you then get your 53,200 which would be the required 2020 estimate. For question 18, there is a competition question. It says competition occurs when required resources are in short supply. Inter-specific competition occurs when, and it gives you a set of statements. The correct answer for 18 is B, different species compete for a few of the same resources. Now, first off, you need to remember your different types of competition. Interspecific is between different species, and they're going to compete because they will require some of the same resources. 
if you remember, within the same population, which is intraspecific, because they are members of the same species, they are going to compete for all the same resources. That's why intraspecific competition is the more intense form. So for 18, B, different species competing for a few of the same resources. 19 is quite a lot to fit just on the one screen here. Um, so if you have your own copy, that may be easier for you, or you can pause it in different parts. It's showing you two tables here at, uh, of sample sites and the effectively the abiotic factors of the sample sites and the organisms they have found in each sample sites. It says that six different sample sites in a stream, the oxygen concentration, pH, and numbers of different organisms were recorded. The higher the number of organisms in the sample, the more abundant they are, so the more often they are. And the re results are shown in the tables. So we have table one, which shows you the oxygen and pH, and table two, which has the four organisms they were sampling for. Um, if I leave it here, you should be able to see the whole thing. But the question says, using the results from both tables, identify which of the following conclusions is false. So again, you're going through each of these statements here. Uh, this time, though, you're looking for the one that is not true, the one that is false. So the answer for question 19 is going to be C, that mayfly nymphs are at their most abundant when the oxygen concentration is lowest. Uh, again, I'll go through each of these here. So for question A, uh, freshwater, or option A, freshwater snails do not survive in water with a lower pH. Now that's true because if you look at the sample sites, there are no snails in the sample sites with lower pH levels. So if you look at sample sites one to four, there's an abundance of zero, but we also see the pH here is lower than it is uh, in sample sites five and six, for example. So that is true, so that's not the answer we're looking for. For B, changes in pH have little effect on the distribution of dragonfly nymphs. Again, that is true. If you look at the abundance of dragonfly nymphs, there is very little change, uh, even when the pHs are quite different. Uh, C, the correct answer, mayfly nymphs are at their most abundant when the oxygen concentration is lowest. You can see here that most uh, of the mayfly nymphs are found in site six which does not have the lowest oxygen concentration. So that is looking untrue. And again, just to check all of them, D, the chironomid fly larvae are at their most abundant when the oxygen concentration is at its lowest. That's true, you can see there's more of them in site five, quite significantly so, which also has the lowest oxygen concentration. So again, that is true. The only one that is false is C. Nearly finished now for question 20, it's asking about uh, your diagram of leaf structure. In which parts of a green leaf would most photosynthesis occur? So for 20, the correct answer is D, it would be spongy mesophyll and palisade mesophyll. So the palisade mesophyll cells are at the top, they're the ones that are stacked together, they look sort of like a fence, and just below that is the spongy mesophyll, uh, which although they also will take place in photosynthesis, they're not packed together as tightly. They have these air gaps between them to allow the, the movement of gas. The other options here, the guard cells, if you remember, control the opening and closing of the stomata and the epidermal layers are just for protection. They are not going to be taking place in photosynthesis. So the correct answer is D. For question 21, the table shows the rate of photosynthesis in a plant under different light intensities going from 10 to 50. And you can see the rate of photosynthesis is increasing from 2 to 85. The question asks, which change in light intensity produced the greatest increase in the rate of photosynthesis? So the correct answer for 21 is A, 10 to 20 kilolux. For this one here, you have to go through and basically calculate the difference each time to see which one had the greatest increase you should find that between two and 28, that's an increase of 26, which is the highest of each of these. So A, 10 to 20 kilowatts. For 22, it says a gardener decided to treat his crops with both fertilizer and pesticides. And the result of this would be, it gives you a range of options about nitrates and crop yield. 
For 22, the correct answer is B. There would be an increase in soil nitrates because fertilizer adds nitrates, which is also going to be increasing crop yield, and there'd be an increase in crop yield. The pesticides would also kill the pests that are trying to eat your crops. So by adding fertilizer and pesticides, you're going to increase your crop yield and the fertilizer itself is going to eat, uh, increase more of your soil nitrates as well. So B is the correct answer. For question 23, we're looking at algal bloom. It says, which of the following could occur as a result of fertilizer leaching into a freshwater pond? So it's asking for the effect, either an increase or decrease, on the algae population, the bacterial population, and the oxygen concentration of the water. The correct answer for 23 is D. So we're going to have an increase in algae population. So that's going to be caused by the fertilizer leaching into the water. So the algae is going to grow more. There's going to be an increase in that population, which leads to algal bloom. This is then going to spread across the surface of the water. It's going to block the sunlight from reaching the aquatic plants below. So these plants are going to die off. And if you remember, they become food for the bacteria. So the bacteria are going to eat all these dead plants. And because of that, because of the abundance of food, they are then going to increase in population. So bacterial population increases also. And then finally, what's going to happen is the bacteria uh, that's increased in population, they're going to use up all the oxygen within that ecosystem. So the oxygen concentration is going to decrease and this will ultimately lead to the death of that ecosystem. So if you remember the stages of algal bloom. And on the final page, 24, says for the successful biological control of whitefly in a greenhouse, it was recommended to use 50 individuals of a predator species to kill a population of 1,500 whitefly. The number of predators that would be required to kill 21,000 whitefly is. So correct answer for 24 is B, 700. So it's told you that you need 50 predators to kill 1,500 whitefly. So we need to basically upscale this to 21,000 whitefly. So divide your 21,000 whitefly by 1,500. That's going to give you 14. So it's 14, 14 sorry, times more than what we were told. Uh, so you would also multiply your 50 by 14 to get 700. So you're keeping that, that sort of ratio the same. And finally, for question 25, which of the following statements describes the possible effects of a mutation on the survival of an organism? So the correct answer for 25 is D. It's one, two, and three. It's a bit of a trick question. They all have, uh, they all can have that impact. So if you remember, mutations can be advantageous, they could be disadvantageous, or they could be entirely neutral. So they give no effect. So all of these, one, two, and three, could have that effect. So uh, hopefully you found this useful and you've went along with these questions. If you've found any that you've got wrong, hopefully you understand where you've went wrong. It, like I said, it might just be a gap in your knowledge. It might be that you've made a little mistake reading the question or any other small mistakes like that. Hopefully you can go and fix. Uh, I'll go and do some more of these videos as well if people find them useful and hopefully we'll get on to a short answer page as well which can be a bit trickier. Thanks so much for following these videos and for your comments and I hope your revision is going well. Best of luck.